Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here, and this is week 11, which means it is chapter 10 in our MindTap, in our American History textbook. And I really like the way the textbook author has taken the last two chapters and broken them apart. And what I'm talking about is, if you remember last week, chapter 9 was all about the South, and it talked about uh, Southern culture and Old South culture and really keyed in on two themes, agriculture and race, well, and slavery, I guess, but but those were the, the biggies, and that's really all it talked about. It talked about uh, family relationships, it talked about farming, and it talked about tobacco and cotton and Western, Western or westward, sorry, movement. Um, but it was it was really keyed in on this idea of, of uh, agriculture and plantations, and even really kind of talked about the fact that there were really no large cities and, and most of the South was very rural as as it moved westward. So that was the Southern part of American history in the antebellum era, which is this era uh, prior to the Civil War. Remember, antebellum is before the war. And, um, but, but the thing the book has done differently than a lot of other textbooks is it's, it's got a chapter for the North too. And so you can get contrast between the South and the North as from a cultural perspective uh, prior to the Civil War. So I, I really liked the way it was laid out. And the, the, now one of the problems was, both from your standpoint as a student and my standpoint as the professor, was that, you know, Chapter 9 was nice and short and we got through it. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of stuff that was startling. And then all of a sudden, Chapter 10 is this monster chapter. And um, I think that in itself tells you that there was a lot more social activity and stuff going on in the North than there was in the South. And as you read through some of these topics, I mean, I can't even lecture through all of this because there's so much it would take forever. So we're just going to kind of hit the highlights here. Uh, but but just to say, I do like the way it was done. And, and you do have a quiz this week. And um, maybe I can bring that up uh, before we finish. So uh, let me let me take care of that. So um, one of the things that's happening is the first question the book asks is the North distinctive. And, and whether you know it or don't know it, by the time you read the rest of the chapter and, and compare it or contrast it to what you read last week, you would certainly say, yes, the North was definitely distinctive because there's a lot going on. I mean, it's either that or the textbook author, you know, wants to pay more attention to the North on purpose, but but I don't think so. I think uh, these chapters give a fairly realistic view of the societies, and the North was distinctive in the fact that, or in the sense that it was really active. And and I think one of the reasons it was active was because of industry and market forces. And once I move on a little bit, I think that will become clear to you. So. Um, transportation revolution, really important because this time period is really the ramp up for the Industrial Revolution in the U.S. Some historians call this period of time between, I don't know, 1820 and the Civil War, the market revolution. And it, it truly is a market revolution in the North. And so the, the, the chapter talks about the transportation revolution and the biggies there are, you know, at one time there was nothing. And um, then the first big deal in the country was the Erie Canal, which was built in 1825, I think. And, and so the Erie Canal, if you're familiar with that geography up there in upstate New York, uh, you know, the Hudson River comes in New York City and, and goes up to upstate New York. Actually, it goes down to New York City. But anyway, if you follow the Hudson up, you'll end up, you know, in Albany. And then from Albany to, to uh, Buffalo is, I don't remember, a few hundred miles. But, you know, if you can get to Buffalo, you can connect to, the, to Lake Erie. So by connecting the Hudson River to Lake Erie via the Erie Canal, you had these amazing new transportation opportunities uh, and, and couple that along with steamboats that could go up and down. You know, now you were getting to the point where, um, you know, between steamboats on rivers and canal boats on canals, you could you could haul goods to market. So all of these farmers in upstate New York, um, you know, could could get their produce to market. And and it really changed the way that agriculture started to happen in the U.S. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But it also really expanded all of this area through New York. And and uh, I mean, cities like um, Syracuse. All right. Syracuse, like, you know, expanded 20 fold uh, with the Erie Canal. So 
all of these cities, uh, Syracuse for sure, all the way up to Buffalo, uh, Rochester, uh, Albany, certainly the capital, you know, got really big, but also these Great Lakes markets began to open up. And so now you could ship stuff all the way down the Hudson to New York City. And if you can get it to New York City, you're on the Atlantic. So international trade even feels the effect of the Erie Canal. It's a real big deal at the time and sort of marks the beginning of the canal craze. And uh, if you're from around here where I'm at right now, Northwest Ohio, certainly you've seen the canals around here off the Maumee River. But if you live anywhere in Ohio, any, actually anywhere in the Midwest, you know, you know of some local canals that are closed now, but you can go visit, you know, where they were at and what the locks were and all that stuff. So uh, canals were a big deal. And, and that's really the beginning of this transportation revolution. But uh, canals were short-lived because shortly thereafter, the railroad was going to uh, get to be um, something that really worked well after they worked out all the difficulties with it. But, you know, the railroad now, you didn't have to be near a river. You didn't have to be near a canal. It was easy and cheap to build railroad tracks. So that's the you know, sort of the phase two of the transportation revolution, that the railroad was being built out. And, you know, the South had railroads too, not very many canals, but the South had railroads and they had water routes because they had more rivers in the South, but it didn't grow like the North because the North was becoming rapidly industrialized. And this idea of market revolution not only affected agriculture through canals and transportation, uh, but also manufacture and manufacturing. So um, the North was big into manufacturing, but manufacturing and markets don't evolve until you have a transportation network or infrastructure, and that's why that's important. And so the chapter talks about the transportation revolution. Um, I guess one of the things they don't talk about is the agricultural re revolution, because nobody really does talk about that. And since I grew up on a farm, I'm obliged to talk about it. But, but just sort of the overarching big picture, when you read about these revolutions, like the Industrial Revolution, all right, there can't be an industrial revolution without an agricultural revolution. So just kind of keep that in mind, and you'll not read this anywhere, but it's, I, I think it's important for us to understand. You can't have you know, a whole bunch of people moving to the city unless there's food for them, and the only way you can make sure that those people can eat is if there's an industrial revolution in the sense that um, uh, farms can be more productive. They can produce more crops per acre or more milk per you know head of cattle or whatever your measurement is. And certainly one of the things that I don't think the book pays enough attention to, but they might mention it, is the invention of like the steel plow. There actually was a guy named John Deere, all right? And he invented the steel plow. So that was a big deal. And uh, I think you'll read a little bit about Cyrus McCormick in there. I don't know. But if not, uh, Cyrus McCormick, you know, invented the reaper. So now harvest could be bigger and planters were invented. And, and so... Um, these were amazing leaps in agricultural technology, and we have to recognize that you really can't have this urbanization or industrialization uh, until you have an agriculture and transportation revolution because you have to be able to get food from the farmer fields into the cities. It's really important, but for sure that was going on in the north. Uh, the North, uh, you know, raised a lot more food uh, than the South. The South was, you know, very specialized in uh, tobacco and cotton. Not that they didn't raise food, but, but you know, the big agriculture around there was really specialized for, for cotton and tobacco and, and other things that they can sell in international markets. So um, there's that part. So the book talks about the rise of uh, the emergence of uh, industrialization and, you know, stuff like steel mills and, and not like we have today, but but and not actually even steel iron uh, iron mills and iron manufacturing, you know, prior to the Civil War. You know, the North had that stuff and the South, I think, had one or two ironworks, you know, for the entire South. So there's a great disparity in industrialization between the North and the South and manufacturing. Uh, certainly there were a ton of textile mills up in New England in the Boston area and, uh, you know, off the Merrimack River and, and, and some of these uh, uh, big water wheel driven textile mills were up in New England, actually processing cotton that was picked by slaves. But anyway, uh, again, industrialized and a free labor force. There wasn't any slavery um, at, at that point in time in the North and the labor force was all free. 
free, and there's even this uh, free labor ideology that you read about where you know philosophers and economists felt that people will get ahead if they work for wages because they know if they work more, they can earn more, and that rises people up. And that was one of the issues with slavery, that there was no incentive uh, for slaves, so they would always be this exploited group. But I'm, I'm getting off track. But anyway, there's a lot of industrialization up in, in New England in the north. And the other thing the book talks about then is consumption and commercialization. So um, all of a sudden, there's a standardization of clothing. There's stores opening. There are these new transportation routes to ship goods around. And manufacturing gets specialized and farming gets specialized. So what I mean by that is uh, prior to the market revolution, farming was what you call subsistence farming. And sus subsistence farming is where you know you move out to the farm with your family and your sole purpose in life is raising enough food to feed your family for the entire year. So you're subsisting, you're, you know, and, and subsistence, subsistence farming is really the backbone of the early agriculture movement in the United States. But, but with the market revolution, it changed to specialized farming, uh, how I grew up. So I grew up on a dairy farm. You know, our whole thing was about, you know, raising cows, keeping them health, healthy and selling the milk. So that's what we cared about. We weren't subsistence farmers. My, you know, my mom would go to the store to buy vegetables, you know, just like we do today. She didn't raise her own, although some did. But, you know, we didn't farm to feed the family. We farmed to produce milk and to sell the milk to get money. And then, you know, hopefully that profit and expansion of the farm would make more money. So, you know, we could add on to our house or, you know, whatever. So, the, so there's this big change in farming to specialization uh, with markets. And it talks about that a little bit in the book. I'm, I'm uh, abnormally interested in farming, so that I, I don't want to bore you with that. But, but uh, again, I mean, you may have relatives or friends that are farmers, or you may be farmers and you're like, okay, we, we raise beans, okay, soybeans. That's an example of specialized farming. Um, then there's always a chapter and there's or a section in there about the family. And um, I don't like the section because I think it's written from a middle class white standpoint. And it doesn't talk about single moms and other families during that period. So we're going to forget about it. And then the book talks about the growth of cities, you know, also known as urbanization. So uh, one in the same. And and the cities that, again, if you're in the Midwest, if you're in this area, or regardless of where you're at in the Midwest, if you're in the upper Midwest um, or upper part of the country, cities like Pittsburgh and Buffalo and Cleveland and Chicago and Cincinnati are really starting to grow before the Civil War. Now, the West-West, you know, isn't happening yet. The, the uh, uh, Transcontinental Railroad isn't even going to come until after the Civil War in 1869. But certainly the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes area, the growth of these big cities, uh, Toledo, okay, would be one of them, Columbus, um, Indianapolis, you know, all of these cities are starting to grow in the mid-1800s. And they're, and they're growing because, you know, they're either on rivers or mainly they're on, you know, ra they're railroad hubs. They're on railroad routes. Certainly Chicago, you know, being the farthest west port on the Great Lakes with, you know, it, 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 you know as far as being a reasonable climate's concerned with railroads uh, is going to boom eventually because it's a sub, it's a hub of, of western transportation. But, but that having been said, these cities grow. And the reason they grow is not only because of industrialization, but also this massive influx of immigrants. So this is like the first wave of immigration into the U.S., and uh, our class ends at the Civil War, so we're not going to be around to learn about the other waves. But this first big wave of uh, immigration comes um, in the late 1840s, and most all of them are Irish and, and or German. So again, our urbanization uh, accelerates because you have this influx of immigrants. So that's one of the reasons city grow, or cities grow. And then the book talks about all the problems with cities, which you know about you know, bad sewage, germs, no sewage when they started, uh, bad living conditions, fire hazards, disease, crime, and all of that stuff. So you can read about that in the book. But, but that's sort of new uh, in the North, that, that we have these big cities, and with big cities come interesting problems or interesting opportunities, however you look at it. Um, and the book moves on to talk about the Second Great Awakening, which 
if you remember from a few chapters back around the time of the American Revolution, there was the Great Awakening or the First Great Awakening. Uh, so, you know, now in the antebellum era, in the mid-18, early 1800s, there's the Second Great Awakening and the same kind of thing. Uh, re religious revival uh, captures the spirit of many Americans, both middle class and lower class. And um, the... The, the kind of the cool thing about this section is that you start to read about this impulse for improvement and reform in the country, and this is before the Civil War. So those of you who know a little bit about American history know that the big reform movements came in the Progressive Era, which is, again, after our class ends in the early 1900s. But certainly in the early 1800s, there's uh, impulse towards reform. And by reforms, I mean... Uh, you know, people are thinking about public schools. So how can we care for children? They're thinking about uh, clean housing and, and water systems and sewage systems and, and a little bit of public health, although germ theory isn't on the radar screen yet. People don't know yet why they get sick. They won't know that until after the Civil War, really, either. Um, but, but this idea of reform and seeking perfection is really interesting because it's a thread that runs through U.S. history of, up until at least the Progressive Era. And, and, you know, they'll mention like Dorothea Dix in there. So she, certainly um, she was a, a woman, of course, reformer who, you know, felt like we need to do something for the mentally ill, for example. So she was a really one behind the asylum movement where instead of just locking up the mentally ill, you actually tried to, to help them and, and uh, help them heal. So um, Dorothea Dix is in there and, and you'll read about a few other reformers, but like the, the movement towards, uh, uh, humane penitentiaries and rehabilitation of criminals, um, all of these reforms are, are in the air. Many of them are Christian based and many of them come out of this second great awakening and this idea of, of, uh, uh, the Christian doctrine of, of, you know, loving your brother. So there's that part. And then um, there's a very cool part. And I, I when I was uh, uh, in grad school, I was really into all these utopian histories. So um, the book talks about utopian movements in the country. And, you know, the, so the biggest one are the Mormons. So originally the Mormons, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, you know, formed as this utopian movement. And uh, so some of you know Mormon history, but if not, there's just enough in the book to get you interested. So you're going to read about the, Nor the Mormons. Uh, Joseph Smith founded them, and uh, the group eventually moves to Salt Lake City. But they actually go through Ohio and uh, go through Illinois and, and, and make their way out west. So that's a, that's a cool story. And uh, you'll read about some of the communal living ex experiments that were going on, like the Oneida experiments and... And I think that's in the book. And then the Pella experiment, for example, you won't read about that one. Amana, uh, that's another one. These movements that, um, you know, basically people get together and say, hey, we, we're going to live as a, co a commune, this idealized community, and here's how we're going to do it. Uh, unfortunately, those communal arrangements kind of get weird in almost every case. Somebody's like, okay, you know, we're, we're living this way. Everything's in the up and up, but I can have 10 wives, you know? So there's always this weirdness going on with these communal <laughs> movements, but they're fascinating to read about. And, and, um, you know, it's an exciting time in U S history because you have, you know, immigrants and people that have come over from Europe and people here that have these brand new ideas and they have some money and they can get property. So they just go off and do their own thing. So there's a lot of free thinkers and, and you know, kind of weird religious people and, and just it's an incredible time. And, and, and when you read about, uh, you know, culture, you'll read about, uh, you know, Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. And, and so these guys, I mean, Thoreau especially, were like, you know, kind of, intellectual radicals for their day. So there's really this flourishing of of culture, I think, prior to the Civil War. So we need to think about that as uh, also. Um, lastly, the, the thing I just want to talk about is, and I don't know that I have it in my notes, but um, abolition. So abolitionism or abolitionist uh, certainly um, you know, come to be up north. That's where the, the anti-slave people start. Um, and so you're going to read about abolition, abolition movements, but, but, um, and there's some different types. There's like evangelical abolition, abolitionist and, and immediate, immediate and all these different things. But, but just know that abolitionists are people that are anti-slavery and the North is known for that. But at the same time, not everyone in the North is an abolitionist. And I think, 
as history students, sometimes we see things in black and white, light, you know, black and white, like everyone in the South wanted slavery and everyone in the North didn't want slavery. And certainly it wasn't that way at all. There were a lot of people in the North who weren't necessarily against slavery and worried about it for, you know, all the same reasons. Like, what are we going to do with these people? Is the economy going to collapse? You know, what, you know, what's going to happen? So um, keep that in mind as you read through the abolition section of this. And I, I think the book does a pretty good job to tell you that, um, you know, there's some people in the North that aren't into it either. So uh, sorry this went so long. It was a really long chapter, but but read through it because it's really, there's stuff you, I guarantee there's stuff you never heard of in this chapter before, and that's kind of cool. So uh, that's it for this week. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks a lot. Be safe. See you soon. Bye-bye.